Um, thank you, Yupeng, for that uh, really nice introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, um, Jin and uh, Yuchi for uh, helping me with organizing this entire talk for the invitation. Um, I found this a really pleasant uh, surprise and a very interesting group of people, given the fact that it's contemporaries who are young researchers in mechanics. So I feel honored to be invited to this particular group of uh, researchers. Um, <clears throat> so to jump into my talk, um, my, my main focus of today is going to give you a rather broad overview. I, I wasn't quite sure about the breadth of expertise in my audience today. So I decided to go into um, giving you an idea of how of the dynamic response of materials, how we use kinetics of microscopic defects with two specific examples, one from my doctoral research and one from my more recent postdoctoral research. So these two examples, uh, to give you a little um, early on summary, one, they would seem to be from two very different types of problems, but then with very similar ideas at the microscopic length scales. So um, I'm not going to bore you any more with overviews. I'm going to get, dive right into it. <clears throat> so um, if you're talking about materials at their extremes, what do we see around us? How do we perceive um, these kind of problems? Um, this is an example at very long length scales. This is an earthquake mechanics and some very interesting work on understanding earthquakes from the perspective of dynamic behavior of materials has emerged. Uh, more in, in recent years. Um, the second example is something that we probably are a little more connected to, or we probably, uh, this is a little more intuitive to us in the sense that we're talking about uh, dynamic impact, we're talking about damage and deformation of materials. This is in this case, structural materials. Um, this is a case from something that we in the research area probably read about, especially those of us who do uh, dynamic behavior of materials. This is an example from a hypervelocity impact experiment where a steel ball has impacted an aluminum plate. And I, I think this is steel, and forgive me if I made a mistake with that, but the idea is the impact was at velocities of the order of five to eight kilometers per second. And what happens here is, of course, you have a lot of excavation of material, you have a huge complication of mechanisms happening here, but then you see this separation or this failure surface at the back end where the steel ball hasn't really penetrated the sample. And this is an example of where shock waves interact with each other to create failure sites. So this is another form of extreme uh, impact damage. And this is an example that I promise I will talk about towards the latter end, towards the end of my talk. And this is a very interesting example where you take a, a ferroic material, you take a material which has some polarization to it, and you basically detonate something behind it with very high explosive, right? And then what you end up with is an energy generator. This was research that is, in my opinion, still in its early stages, but has very exciting potentials, especially with our modern drive towards energy generation and storage. So um, what do we see? We've seen that these are different types of problems we can deal with, but how do we actually understand these problems from uh, a materials and mechanics perspective? So first of all, I'm gonna define what I call an extreme event. So we're talking about large amplitude stimuli or short time scales. In this case, I've talked, I've said, and short time scales because those are the type of problems I am interested in. But in reality, for example, a wave propagation is a small amplitude stimulus, uh, it's a small amplitude stress pulse, for example, at very short time scales, and that is also considered a dynamic event. So in this case, today we'll be talking about large amplitude, amplitude stimuli at short time scales. So when you consider that kind of a problem, let's take, for example, a plate that you see in the figure here and then you have a localized impact. So you have a velocity boundary condition on the sample. You have waves that propagate inside the medium. And so these are localized disturbances inside the material. And then you have heterogeneous defects that nucleate in a stressed region of the material, right? So the objective of giving you this schematic is to, is to, is to basically tell you that a lot of these dynamic phenomena are heterogeneous in nature. And why do we care that they're heterogeneous in nature? We'll see through the rest of the stuff, right? So one key to understanding these dynamic material response is in understanding short time scale phenomena at short length scales because of the heterogeneity, right? What I mean by heterogeneity is that you have a lot of microscopic mechanisms that kick in inside the material. And to be able to observe these short time scale phenomena at these short length scales is critical in understanding material response and possibly predicting them using robust models. So this is an example of a canonical experiment where you have an, uh, a, high, a high velocity impact into a steel plate and you can see a whole slew of mechanisms that kick in. And our objective is in being in trying to isolate some of these mechanisms and understand these mechanisms in more detail, right? Um, and of course, um, I'm not sure what the format of, uh, of, the, of this talk is, but then if anyone has questions in the audience right now, please feel free to stop me and ask me questions. <clears throat> So um, I'm presenting to you a paradigm for how we understand multi-scale material response. So here you're seeing a length scale and time scale plot. 
Um, at the macroscopic length scales, um, we're talking about texture, which is essentially a volume average measure of the orientation of grains in, in the case of a polycrystalline sample. And that defines your material response. When you go shorter length scales, you have heterogeneous deformation. These are examples of shear localized or localized deformation bands inside magnesium uh, polycrystals. At much smaller scales, you have the kinetics of defects. So you have these localized defects that propagate through the medium that control the strength of the material or the response of the material, if you may. And understanding how fast these defects propagate eventually govern how, what the material strength is. And we'll see how this works um, going forward into the talk. And of course, if you want to understand why defects propagate at certain velocities or why there are specific kinetics to how these defects propagate, you need to understand the structure of these defects down to smaller length scales. So especially when you go to short time scales, understanding these multiple length scales also becomes important. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to give you, with the, in this slide, um, I'm going to give um, a, a very simple introduction or sort of a, um, something that a lot of you would have looked up in a continuum thermodynamics textbook, if you may, but this will help us understand the type of problems we're dealing with. So here I've shown you an example of what some of us might call a continuum potato. It's simply a continuum body. Um, it has a particular structure to it. This is the material. So this is the continuum body. You have a particular structure to it, and this is the material. And the material is defined by a particular free energy density, right? And we all know that if you apply some sort of stimuli to this, um, to this body, which is in this case mechanical, you will have a shift in this minimum potential energy density, which, which, which we call the potential energy density. And the minima of that would basically identify the state of the system. In this case, it would be the stress of the material uh, as a function of strain. Now, the problems we deal with are problems where you have multiple stable configurations, which essentially means that you can have different types of phases uh, inside the, existing inside the material, and the phases would be defined by some interface, right? So that means that this potential energy density becomes a double well potential where each well here defines some stable configuration of your medium. Now, when you apply a stimuli, these problems get a lot more interesting now because now your double well potential tilts towards a more stable configuration. And if you look at the schematic here, what that, what that really means is that your, your interface begins to get driven towards a particular direction. Now at quasi-static rates, right? So when you're doing this in a very slow experiment, you can accurately characterize how these interfaces propagate and you can get an idea of the macroscopic response property of the material um, as a function of, for example, an applied um, stimuli. But then when you start going to short time scales, when you're applying what we call a non, when we're looking at what we call a non-equilibrium material response, characterizing these defect kinetics become very important. In a lot of cases, we do this in an ad hoc method by using experimental measurements and that, that's mostly the techniques we'll be using through the rest of the talk, but being able to understand the kinetics of the velocity of these boundaries basically governs how fast the material deforms or the strength of the material and so on and so forth. So these are the type of problems we'll be looking at. And you can look at a whole range of problems with this, uh, with this um, perspective in this particular framework. And here I've given you four specific examples. We'll be discussing two of these examples today and two of these examples from my, from my research over the years. The first is an example from material strength. So this is a single crystal of magnesium that has been deformed dynamically. We'll be talking about this data in a little, in a lot more detail in the next few slides. Um, <clears throat> but what you see as these heterogeneous deformation inside the medium is what we call deformation twins. So these are basically interfacial defects that propagate inside the medium. So the volume defects bound by surfaces and the propagation of these defects govern the material response of the material, or, or govern the strength of the material, right? The second example is from an area of multiphysics. This is uh, a lot of the current focus of my work. We're looking at ferroelectric materials where you have a coupling between electrical, mechanical, and thermal fields. And the evolution of these electromechanical responses depends on these heterogeneous microstructures at the smaller end scales. We'll talk about this in a little more detail as well later on. The third example is from uh, the area of shape memory alloys, which is also a multifunctionality problem where essentially you have thermal and mechanical fields that couple to each other resulting in phase transformations and phase boundaries that propagate, resulting in a macroscopic um, multifunctional response. And the fourth example is something that's non-intuitive. It was non-intuitive to me when I first looked at it. And this is an example from the area of tissue remodeling. Essentially, the idea was what you see here is two black spots are active particles that were embedded inside um, an active um, uh, active medium. In this case, I think it was a tissue. And the interaction between these two active particles occurred by a densification of the medium between these two uh, uh, active particles. The active particles were designed to mimic cells and cell interactions. 
And it turns out that you could treat this problem as a different phase because of the densification bounded by a phase boundary that is moving as the cells interact with each other. So the application of this kind of a, of a, of a framework across length and time scales um, is applicable across a wide range of problems. So today we'll be talking about two specific, specific examples. The first problem is going to be from the area of viscoplasticity. We're going to be talking about the dynamic behavior of magnesium. We'll be talking about magnesium single crystals and what happens when you deform them dynamically, right? So um, this is an example data set that we'll be talking about in a lot more detail. The width of the sample here that you see in this image is um, of the order of three millimeter. And within a span of a few tens of microseconds, you see a huge uh, distribution of these heterogeneous mechanisms that kick in. And we'll be talking about this in a little more detail now. <clears throat> so first, why, do we, why are we interested in magnesium? Um, this has been um, a material of interest for a little more than two decades, if I'm not right. I'm sure a lot of you know about this uh, material by now. But the idea was basically that it has a much lower density than aluminum. And so the specific strength is higher. And people are trying to improve the strength of this material for dynamic structural applications, simply because of efficiency. Right? So um, for those of you who do not live in the world of crystals and plastic deformation, I'm going to give you a quick primer on what this is about. So we know that the most common plastic deformation mechanisms are called dislocations. Essentially, the idea is if you have a, homo of a, if you have a repeated, repeatable crystal structure, um, you break the symmetry by introducing an extra plane of atoms. And when you apply a shear force, this plane of atoms will move along a particular direction. And that's how plasticity or plastic deformation of the metal is accommodated. Um, in magnesium, it has a hexagonal close packed crystal structure as opposed to uh, some of the more conventional cubic crystals that um, we would have studied in a, in a mechanics of materials class, if you may. And it turns out that in magnesium, the stresses that is required for dislocation slips, so that extra plane of atoms to slip within the plane of this magnesium crystal, as you can see in the left schematic, is a lot lower than what you require to slip out of plane. And what this effectively means that if I try to apply some um, uh, deformation mode or a deformation tensor to this magnesium crystal, I will end up with a very strong anisotropy, which basically means that the strength of the material is very low when you shear it in the plane of the crystal versus out of the plane of the crystal. Right? So what happens when that kind of an anisotropy happens? You have the kicking in of a different deformation mechanism, and this is called a, dis uh, a deformation twin. And we'll be talking about a, what, a, what a deformation twin looks like uh, in the next slide. But the idea basically is that because dislocations are much harder to kick in out of plane, you have another mechanism that is much easier to nucleate, which is called a deformation, uh, deformation twin. So um, here you're seeing three different length scales of images of the deformation twin. So if you look at a microscope image, a deformation twin could be thought of as a lenticular band here. You can see the shape of the deformation twin that's formed inside magnesium crystals. And if you zoom in further using high resolution transmission electron microscopy, you can see that the twin boundary, so the interface between a, a deformation twin and the matrix of your sample um, is defined by a reorientation of the crystal structure, right? So effectively, the, if you have a, a matrix with a crystal structure that's oriented where my finger is pointing, um, the, the deformation twin would basically have a reorientation of the crystal structure, right? Um, so then we actually generated some uh, twins inside a single crystal of magnesium and in collaboration with uh, our colleagues at Hopkins, uh, we ended up going and doing three-dimensional microscopy. So the, uh, these were the experts in three-dimensional microscopy at Hopkins. So we gave them our samples and they gave us some very interesting data. What you can see here is that these deformation twins are really volume defects. So the regions in green are regions which are the deformation twins and the blue are the matrix itself. And these are basically volume defects that are surrounded by surface defects. So these, the surface defects is what we call deformation twin boundaries, right? So what do we know with this kind of information? What do we want to look for in, with this kind of information? We want to understand how these volume defects influence the strength of our material in this case. So how does it influence the strength of a material at short time scale? So high strain rate deformation. So to be able to understand that, I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview of how we think about this problem. So let's consider an extreme impact event, for example, a bullet penetrating an armor plate. And if I zoom in, what you see is you see these lenticular bands that are, that are um, deformation twins. And you can also see what's called these dislocations that we were talking about previously. Right? So given the fact that we have a whole range of mechanisms that are playing around inside a material, how do we use this to understand material strength? 
Um, at this point, we'll go into a very rudimentary partition of the scalar strain rate. So imagine you have the macroscopic scalar strain rate of your sample. Uh, we can separate that into an elastic and viscoplastic component. The viscoplastic component, you can define an ansatz. And this is, again, for now, let's just take this an, as a ad hoc ansatz, but we'll talk about it in a little more detail later on. Um, so you can separate this into an effect of dislocations and deformation twins. And this is where the kinetics that I'm talking about comes in, right? So the viscoplastic rate of uh, deformation or the viscoplastic strain rate is a function of the stress, function of temperature, and you can go on and define internal variables that control the strength of this material. So this is what controls the strength of the material. And if you use this particular ansatz, we say that the dislocations are driven by shear stresses and temperatures, and twins are, are driven by some stress tensor and temperature, right? How a dislocation is driven by shear stresses and temperature is fairly well understood. We've looked at this. I mean, the community has looked at this for a very long time now. Um, what happens at very high pressures is still an open problem that a lot of people, that some people that I know of at least are studying. Uh, but for now, let's say that some aspect of dislocation slip has been understood. The kinetics of dislocations have been understood. What we do not know is what drives a deformation twin and how fast a deformation twin can propagate. And if we don't know this information, we do not have a good sense of the strength of the material from this multi-scale perspective, right? So this is our goal. We're gonna look at twin kinetics at high strain rates. Um, and before that, I'm just gonna show you data from another study, which looked at what happens to a deformation twin at low strain. So what happens when you do this at quasi-static rates? So these were experiments inside a scanning electron microscope by colleagues um, of ours uh, back at Hopkins. And uh, here they were doing tensile experiments of a polycrystalline sample. So you can see the grain boundaries right here, right? And these were done at very, very slow strain rates. So we're talking about 10 to the minus four strain per second. So one thing you would notice is these lenticular bands, these are the deformation twins. And if you look at it carefully enough and I'll let it run for some time, you'll see that these boundaries propagate at very slow velocities, right? Um, you cannot see where the tips propagated because the tips were just too fast to be observed under an SEM. But you can see that most of the deformation occurs by the growth of these twin boundaries. Um, these twin boundary velocities were measured by the authors at, a, at about 35 nanometers per second. And what you see is, again, like I said, this primarily twin boundary growth that is driving this deformation mode. So now that we have a sense of what happens at low strain rates, we're going to go ahead and look at what happens at high strain rates. And for these, uh, we designed a set of experiments. These are classical experiments that, um, that people in the high strain rate behavior of materials business work on. This is called a Kolsky bar for those of you who don't know what it is. Essentially, the idea is you have a projectile impacting an incident bar. You have a strain pulse that propagates through the incident bar. And then you have a specimen which has a lower acoustic impedance than <clears throat> your bars, right? So you have elastic waves that propagate inside the bars. You can measure this using contact and non-contact measuring techniques. And if you know what the, the, what the strain pulses are at the specimen boundaries, you have a sense of what the strain rates and the stresses inside the specimen are, right? So using this, you can actually measure the stress strain response at different rates. And that's what we went ahead and did. So what you're seeing here is a true stress and true strain response of single crystals of magnesium, right? Um, and what you see in the dotted green uh, curve here is at low strain rates. And what we notice is as you increase the strain rate, you have an increase in the strength of the material, right? And so the question is, how do we understand this increase of strength using these microscopic mechanisms? And we went ahead and did some very interesting high-speed microscopy uh, of the time. This was state of the art at the time that when we did these experiments. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, we we used um, um, a commercial high-speed uh, CCD sensor, um, built a microscope in front of the sensor, and ended up getting very good spatial resolutions of three microns per pixel and 200 nanoseconds per, per frame. So what we're going to see is data from this microscope in combination with the high strain rate impact experiment. Um, so we took single crystals of magnesium, right? This is a schematic of the of the um, uh, unit cell of magnesium. We impacted it along this direction. So if you're able to see my mouse, and if you're not able to see my mouse, it's basically um, along the width or, or the horizontal direction on your screen. And what we observed was twins propagating on these two planes that are marked in <clears throat> yellow. The imaging was done normal to the plane of your screen, which means that we were observing twins, which were projections um, of the actual twins propagating on these three-dimensional planes, right? So you're going to see a movie, uh, which is for a duration of 12 microseconds in real time with a sample thickness of 3.5 millimeter. Um, so what I'm going to do is there's going to be a lot of detail in those images right now. So I'm going to let you watch the uh, data for 
a few seconds, and then I'll talk to you about what we noticed in the data that we can use for understanding material response, right? So I'm going to stop talking for a few seconds and then let you just watch the data for a second. So um, I hope you've taken some time to uh, look at the data. And as you can, as you can um, see, there's a lot going on. And I'm going to try to break this down into specific aspects that we noticed uh, that was very interesting to us, right? So the first thing you'd notice is that there is initial nucleation at the sample edge. And this is simply because of the fact that you have a finite sample. The next thing you would notice is that there was very fast twin tip growth. So this is the deformation twin that nucleated. And this deformation twin is going to propagate really fast. We were talking about something of the order of one kilometer per second, right? The twin tip propagated at a speed of about one kilometer per second, the first twins, and the boundaries were propagating at about 35 meters per second, right? So uh, uh, three orders of magnitude slower than the twin tip. But if you remember from the slower experiments, nine orders of magnitude faster than what uh, the other authors were observing with the in-situ quasi-static experiments. The next thing we notice is that as you continue to apply deformation at these short time scales, you transition from the growth of this twin boundary to nucleation of additional twins. So there's a transition from a growth dominant deformation to a nucleation dominant deformation. Um, and this we did not see in the quasi-static experiments. So we have a sense of the differences in kinetics or differences in mechanisms between the quasi-static rates and the high strain rates. And we're going to go ahead and make some sense of what that means. So for those of you who have not done courses in continuum mechanics or for, for that matter, I promise to give you a little punchline of what these equations mean. So I'm just going to give you a little um, detailed introduction of, of how we can address these kind of questions. So this comes from the area of crystal plasticity where you have a single crystal, right? You deform it, with you apply a particular deformation gradient F to it, and you can separate that into elastic and viscoplastic components. So you have a multiplicative decomposition of your deformation gradient. And if you actually calculate the velocity gradient from the, um, the from the particle velocities of the samples, you end up with an additive decomposition of elastic and viscoplastic components, right? So this is the tensorial equivalent of what we defined early on as the scalar strain rate uncertainty. Now, if I apply the same uncertainty that we said then, where you apply, you say the viscoplastic velocity gradient is because of dislocations in twins, you now have a viscoplastic velocity gradient due to twins as being defined as a shear rate due to deformation twins times the dyadic product between the normal to the twin plane and the direction of the propagation of the twin. So n is a normal to the twin plane and k is the shear direction of the twin. So this can be summed over all the different types of um, twin variants, if you may. So a twin variant is simply a variant that, that is a twin that nucleates on a different twin plane, right? So you sum this over and this is what people use classically in crystal plasticity. The punchline, like I promised, is that if you know what the different types of twins are in your system, and if you know what the shear rate due to twinning is, you have a good sense of how to define the velocity gradient due to twinning and hence the strength of the material from that. So how do we go ahead and looking at that? We look at the shear rate of twinning, that was the gamma dot from here, as a rate of change of twin volume fraction times a crystallographic constant, because remember the twin was a reorientation of the crystal, right? And so you can think of it as a shear about a particular plane. <clears throat> and remember, this is, this is a schematic of some of the images um, that we had in our data. You can do some sophisticated, we did some very simple image processing, but you can go as sophisticated image processing as you want to actually extract the kinetics of the uh, deformation twin. So that's extracting the twin volume fraction rate. So one thing you could do from this twin volume fraction rate using simple geometric analysis is to say that I can separate this into a nucleation rate where rho is a number density of twins. So you can say that at a given image, I have so many new twins that kick in. So you can calculate a twin number density. And then you have a growth rate, which is effectively, effectively this L dot, which is the tip propagation velocity and W dot, which is the boundary propagation velocity. Remember we measured this in our uh, experiments. We, we predict, we measured a, a, a peak twin tip velocity of a kilometer per second and a twin boundary velocity of 35 meters per second. So we have a sense of what these, uh, the orders of magnitude of these numbers are going to be. 
right? So if you do a little bit of simplification of this, and we ended up doing some quantitative image processing, you can extract this competition between nucleation and growth. In this case, what we said was we plotted the total twin volume fraction, which is the symbols in white from two of our experiments. And then we plotted the twin number density in blue, the corresponding twin number densities. And this is where things get interesting, right? So initially, this is the time since the start of the impact loading. And what you see is you see an increase in the twin volume fractions. So, yeah. uh, you have an increase in the twin volume fractions, right? And at this point, you don't have that many twins that kick in. But as your twin volume fractions increase, you start having a significant increase in the twin number density. And what this tells us is as you change the rate of loading, you start transitioning from a twin growth dominant mechanism. This is what we observed qualitatively before, but looking at this quantitatively now, to a twin nucleation dominant definition. And this is likely going to control the strength of the material and why the material showed us higher strength um, at higher strain rates. So to give you um, a schematic description of what we were talking about, um, <clears throat> so we have the growth rate plotted as a function of the nucleation rate. We observed that at long time scales, you have growth that's being a dominant um, deformation, uh, deformation mechanism or the mechanism for controlling strength. And when you go to short time scales, you quickly transition into a nucleation of these additional um, mechanisms kicking, right? So how do we go ahead and understand this from a theoretical perspective? What I've done here is, is I've simply rewritten the previous uh, expression. So this is the rate of change of twin volume fraction. This is your nucleation kinetics, that's your rho dot. That's your twin tip growth. So that's L dot, that's the uh, growth of the twin tip. And this is the growth of the twin boundaries. So this is for summed over every single twin that you see inside a particular um, image in our case. And if you're, a, if you're someone who's a computational expert, you'd probably be talking about an RVE. Um, the only thing we've done here is rewritten the rate, the rho dot as a function of stresses, temperatures, and any other variables that might control the nucleation of additional twins. And we've done the same thing for the twin tip velocities and the twin boundary velocities. And this is what we call kinetics. We don't have these, these, these equations as yet in the sense that we do not have a good way of extracting these relations as a function of driving forces. And that's where um, I, I put out an open problem here that I think experimental mechanics and theoretical mechanics can solve together, right? So here I'm showing you three different scales. This is one of our images. This is from the data. If I zoom in, you know that this is a boundary that's separated by uh, a different orientation of the crystal. And then if you zoom in further, you have a particular structure um, at the smaller length scales um, to this boundary. So the first question is what drives the twin boundary? How do we define the driving forces? Here I've just defined an arbitrary set of potential um, uh, variables that could drive a twin boundary. But the question is what drives a twin boundary, right? Um, this has been solved in classical phase transition literature where essentially what you have is a driving force, a thermodynamic driving force that's defined by a jump in the free energy density um, across the interface and the um, strain energy density across the interface, right? So this is a jump in the strain energy density. So this is the average stress across the interface and this is the jump in the um, deformation gradient across the interface, right? If we understand what drives a twin boundary, the next question is how fast do twins grow? And that we've measured in our experiments. The only thing we don't know is the driving force on the twin boundary. So in this case, we could actually combine high resolution measurements. So we're talking about measuring the, the material response or me measuring deformation gradients, thermal gradients, and so on and so forth across a twin boundary or a phase boundary, and then connecting that with these lower scale models. Um, this is an open question, which I think is applicable, applicable across a wide range of problems, like we discussed early on in the talk. And from there, I'm going to take you to a different problem, um, which is which a seemingly different problem, but you can treat it with the same type of ideas that we've discussed in the previous example, right? So this is an example from the area of multifunctionality in ferroic materials. Um, before I go there, um, does anyone want to, want to stop me and ask me any questions about this right now? Or should I just move on? I can give you a few seconds if someone has questions or if someone is confused at this point. Okay, um, I guess I'll assume that either that, that I can just move on right now, yeah? So um, we're gonna talk about a different material system now. These are multi-physical materials in the sense that you have electrical, mechanical, and thermal fields that interact with each other. And this is from my more recent postdoctoral research. Um, so here we're talk talking about ferroelectric materials, which are characterized with a permanent electrical polarization. So if you can see my video here, imagine you have a block of material with a permanent electrical polarization. 
And upon the application of an electrical field or a mechanical field in the direction opposite to the polarization, you switch the polarization orientation. And you can imagine that with this coupled problem, you have a switch in the electrical polarization as with the application of electromechanical fields. And you can imagine that it's applicable to a wide range of energy storage applications. So it's already used in sensor transducer technology, um, small scale electro optics, and even in um, random access memory. So in it's, it's the property of being able to switch between uh, upward polarization state and a downward polarization state has been used to design memory devices. So let's look at where this permanent polarization comes from, because in a lot of the materials that we deal with, you don't really see that permanent polarization. Um, so imagine you have a perovskite, so sorry, don't imagine, it, this is called a perovskite structure, which is ABO3 type. So you have um, positive uh, two plus ions um, on, the, uh, on the corners of the, of the unit cell. You have a body centered <clears throat> four plus uh, heavy um, positive ion at the center. And then you have oxygen um, ions at the phase centers, right? So this is called a perovskite structure, which is which are a lot of the class of materials that we'll be dealing with. And upon the reduction of temperature to something below what's called the Curie temperature, you end up with the separation of the positive charges and the negative charges, the net positive charges and negative charges inside the system. So you transition from a non-polar phase, which was before, to a polar phase because the positive and negative ions are separated by a particular distance. And this is the polarization inside your sample, right? So um, this is where your permanent polarization comes from. And like, I sh like I've shown you here, that's when you transition from the double well potential where you have multiple configurations that can exist inside your system. In this case, the configurations are defined by two stable states of polarization, which in the non-polar case, you do not have, right? So what happens when I apply an electric field? So here I'm showing you a schematic of the electric field as a function of the electrical displacement. And when I apply cyclic electric fields to the sample, you will have at the microscopic length scales, these heterogeneous mechanisms, so these heterogeneous microstructures that we have seen that, that look very similar to what we saw in the mechanical problem. So the only difference here is in these cases, the microstructure or the change in uh, intensity, so this is called a piezo response force microscope image that we collected from barium titanate. Um, and what we see is that there is a transition in the electrical polarization as well as mechanical properties, local mechanical properties of the material across the interface. So what happens when you apply an electric field to the sample? So this is a schematic of the electrical displacement and the mechanical strain of the sample as a function of the applied electric field. And what you have is a nucleation and growth of these different types of mechanisms. So if I play this again, what you will see is that you have these different domains as we call them, and then they're separated by the interfaces called domain walls. And the propagation of these domain walls is what controls the electromechanical character characteristics of this material. So let's go back to a question of what happens when you go to high rates. So what we did in our lab here at ETH was we went ahead and did macroscopic experiments on barium titanate single, uh, on barium titanate ceramic samples. So these are polycrystals. Um, what we do is we take a barium titanate ceramic with grain sizes of roughly three micrometers, um, and we use an experiment called broadband electromechanical spectroscopy. Um, the idea is you have a cantilever beam sample, which is about 40 millimeters long, three millimeters wide, and about one millimeter thick. And then what you do is you apply cyclic electric fields using electrodes applied to the sample. You apply electric fields of the order of 3.5 megavolts per meter. So in the lab, we're applying about 3,000 to 4,000 volts. So it's a it's a fairly dangerous experiment if you don't know what's going on. Uh, but the idea is we have these in-house uh, charge amplifier circuits that we build and digital image correlation methods that allow us to measure the electrical displacement in the sample and the strains uh, in the sample as a function of the applied electric field. Right. So this is a picture of the experimental setup we have in the lab. Um, this is um, one of our uh, barium titanate samples. You can see the speckle pattern on the sample. These wires are basically used for applying the high voltages. And then we use these stereo uh, rigged cameras that allow us to measure the um, three-dimensional strains or the surface strains on the sample, right? So this is an example uh, data set. So time resolved data over 800, uh, over about 1,000 seconds. We apply a cyclic electric field. So this is a triangular uh, cycle. We measure the change in electrical displacement. That's the red curve here. And we measure the average strain on the surface of the sample as a function of the applied electric field. So this is the electrical displacement and the coupled strain due to purely electric field application. 
And what you see here is you extract that data, you get an elect, you get a history hysteresis. So you see the cycles, right? So what you see in the white curve is electrical displacement as a function of the applied electric field. And if you plot the slope of this electrical displacement as a function of the field, you get what we call the apparent permittivity. So you can think of apparent permittivity as a mobility of switching. So you have polarization and applying electric field means you're switching the polarization back and forth. And how fast this polarization switches with respect to an applied electric field is what defines um, the, the mobility of uh, microscopic domains inside the sample. So we're gonna go ahead and look at these macroscopic experiments as a signature of what happens at the microscopic length scales. And we'll discuss um, what, what this means uh, in, a, in a schematic sense later on, right? So before we go on, I'm gonna define a few terminology. First thing is, if you look at zero applied electric field, the change in polarization, so that's the net polarization that switches back and forth. That is what we call the remnant polarization. The maximum polarization, which is at the maximum applied electric field is what we call the saturation polarization. And the coercive field is a field, is an electric field that we define at um, zero electric displacement or at the mean electric displacement. What this means is when there is a maximum change in electric displacement, right? This can be defined as a maximum slope, so the maximum apparent permittivity. And this is where polarization switching happens the most. Right? And the electric field at this at which this happens is defined is, is something that we use to characterize the driving forces on these microscopic domain walls. Right? So we're slowly trying to converge to this idea of driving forces and kinetics, the mobility of uh, microscopic domain walls. So um, if like I, like I mentioned, um, we use this technique called piezo response force microscopy to map the spatially uh, distributed um, um, uh, polarizations in our sample. So this is our barium titanate sample. You can see these strongly heterogeneous structures, which uh, we call the, the, the different intensities are characterized by different polarization states, which we call domains and the interfaces of the domain walls. So what happens as we change the time scale? Remember, we're interested in dynamic behavior. So what happens as we shorten the time scale? So here we did electric uh, cyclic experiments at a frequency of two times 10 to the minus three Hertz. And as I increase the rate of loading, so as I increase the cycling frequency, what you're going to see is first that the remnant polarization, which is essentially the <clears throat> difference in the polarization or the electrical displacement at zero electric field, that goes down, right? Secondly, what you're going to see is that the asymmetry of the hysteresis loop is changing. So I won't be discussing into the discussing uh, in much detail about the mechanisms of why the asymmetry is changing simply because that's going to take a while. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to see the, the questions that came on chat. So um, I guess I uh, can- Sure, no problem. We can probably go ahead. We, yeah. we will answer that at the final, like after we're talk. Thank sure, yeah. yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, so what's gonna happen here, just so that I get back on track is you have a change in the asymmetry of the hysteresis curves. And at the same time, you have a reduction in the polarization. What this means is that as you change, as you increase the rate of change or the rate of applied electric fields, the net polarization that you can switch is going down, right? Um, and we'll discuss about what this means uh, later on, but the asymmetry is a very interesting problem that if anyone's interested, we can talk about after the talk, but I just won't have enough time to go over that problem in or, or over that mechanism in detail now. So now if I go ahead and post-process all the data that I have, one thing that you can see is the remnant polarization, which are the symbols in white, they go, you, you have a significant drop in the remnant polarization as a function of the frequency. And at the same time, the saturation polarization also goes down as a function of frequency. And what this means that is that if I have a permanent polarization, I'm not able to switch all of this in the opposite direction, despite applying a very high electric field, right? Especially when I go to shorter time scales. The next question is coercive field, right? So this is the coercive field, if I, if I can quickly remind you, was the electric field at which you have the maximum rate of polarization switching. So it's a measure of, it's a macroscopic measure of the driving force on your domain walls at the microscopic scale. So that defines how you can drive your maximum polarization inside your sample. And if you look at the white curves, so these, the, the white points, so these are the points along the negative direction. So remember, it's a cyclic experiment. We're plotting the coercive fields along both directions of the, of the, of applied electric field. And what you can see is if you look at the white points, you have a significant increase in the coercive field as a function of frequency. And what this means that it becomes much harder to drive domain walls as you go to shorter timescales. 
Similar problem comes in um, when you look at the, th there's another question about asymmetry here where you can see that the, the driving forces required to switch polarization along the negative direction is very different or it's the rate dependence itself is very different than in the positive direction. And like I said, the asymmetry is a very, is a fairly complicated question that uh, we have a hypothesis for that, but that I'd be happy to discuss uh, later on uh, in, uh, after the talk. So if I actually plot the maximum apparent permittivity, right? So that would be the peak of these curves as a function of rate. What this tells us is what we've been talking about all this time. Initially, you have a fairly constant um, apparent permittivity. So the mobility of switching does not change that much at very low frequencies. But as you increase the frequency, you have a significant drop in the maximum apparent permittivity, which means that it becomes much more harder to drive domain walls as you go to the higher frequencies, right? So you have a drop in about 40% of the maximum apparent permittivity. So <clears throat> let's go back to our defect, defect kinetics picture in this context, in the context of an electromechanical problem. Um, and I believe I'm running out of time. So I probably have about three, four minutes left. So I'm gonna quickly finish up the talk. We're coming to the end of the talk anyway. Um, so let's look at this schematic where now the red region is one um, polarization state and the black region is a different polarization state. I'm applying some electric field so that I drive the polarization from the red to the black polarization state, which effectively means that I'm driving this domain wall in, in one direction. So I'm, I'm driving from the black to the red polarization state, which means I'm driving the domain wall in a particular direction. So how do I characterize the velocity of this domain wall? This would be using the normal velocity as some function of the thermodynamic driving force that we discussed um, at the end of the last part of the talk. Now, in most calculations, uh, for, for example, in phase field calculations of today, people use what's called a linear kinetic relation, where your driving force is related to the, related to the rate of change of polarization by some mobility parameter. Right? This is the mobility we've been talking about from a macroscopic standpoint, which tells you how easy it is to drive a domain wall. In this case, we're talking about how easy it is to drive macroscopic polarization in a volume average sense. And people use this gradient descent idea, which uh, works well apparently at uh, quasi-static rates, but does not work well when you go to short time scales. So what happens at short time scales? The first question is, can we go ahead and describe non-equilibrium kinetics? The second question is, can we describe the transition to nucleation? So what we would expect is as you drive, so the, the kinetic relation imposes a particular time scale on how fast the domain wall can move. And as you drive the, um, the, 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 the uh, sample at much higher rates, you end up exceeding this time scale. And then you have a transition to a nucleation dominant deformation. And this is a hypothesis based on what we saw in the mechanical uh, experiments on magnesium before, right? So now if we define an average rate of change of polarization, you can characterize it as a growth kinetics and a nucleation kinetics term. Um, just like we looked at in the mechanical problem again, but then this is an open question. How do we actually bring high resolution experiments and classical theory that we've looked at uh, to answer some of these questions? And I'm gonna leave you with this, uh, with this question. And this is a question I've been thinking about for a while. And I hope I can get some input from, from other experts in the area, uh, especially the theoretical and computational ones as well uh, on how to describe these kind of problems at small scale, right? So um, I'm gonna jump to my conclusion right away. <clears throat> and I hope I've convinced you that Looking at non-equilibrium material response, especially at short and length scale, short length and time scales uh, simultaneously is very useful both for science, of course, um, but also for engineering applications. We looked at an example from deformation twinning where uh, we used high-speed imaging techniques to look at <clears throat> these interfacial kinetics. Um, we observed that the increase in strength is coupled to um, a transition from a growth dominant mechanism to nucleation dominant mechanism. We then took these ideas to ferroelectric ceramics, which are which involve electromechanical coupling. Um, and we observed a lot of interesting phenomena during cyclic experiments where you have asymmetric switching and then you have a rate dependence in the switchability of uh, these ferroelectric ceramics. We connect that to domain wall kinetics and we're still in search for the exact mechanisms for why these rate effects um, uh, occur in. And we discuss some future perspectives of how we can use this idea uh, to move forward. So I hope I've gotten a lot of you excited about this problem, and I hope to find a lot more future collaborators uh, on some of these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vidinesh. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, first, any questions from the audience? Uh, please click the button for raising hand. Okay, Jin, I saw you, let me... 
Yeah. Oh, you can maybe maybe let the uh Shrey uh Nevis so she, he can ask first. Sure. Actually, we have the we have his. I mean, he tells me. Yeah, he's so here. I, uh, if let me let me unmute. Let me find. <clears throat> okay. Shinimus. Uh, if you would like to ask, you can ask. I ask, I mean, I give you the access to mic, but if you prefer uh, that, uh, you can go ahead to answer the question in the chat box directly, probably. Sure, I mean, I can also, if Srinivas is listening in, I can talk about it, but I can also send him a direct message. Um, but the question basically for the other audience was, um, this was from Srinivas uh, Dodapaneni. I hope I pronounced your name right. And if I'm not, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a, he, he asks, London Metro trains purchased from Japan experience crack propagation in undercarriage chassis. What is your take on preventing future instances? They use BSEN 10025 uh, S360JR structural steel, which stands 360 joules impact at minus 20 degrees C. Any suggestions to BSEN and ISO standards? Uh, I must say I am not an expert in the standards. I, I really don't um, look at that. I mean, I, I don't know enough about the standards, but then we're talking metro trains. Um, so it, it really depends on how you define the, uh, the boundary conditions for these problems. Um, with steels, typically crack propagation occurs because of the inclusions inside the sample. So typically you have uh, heterogeneities inside the sample. Um, because of the, the, the presence of second phase particles, for example, are good for strengthening the material, but they're not necessarily good for toughening the material, which effectively means that you could have, you could actually make the material stronger when you apply a stress to it, but then when you're uh, basically looking at nucleation of fracture, uh, it becomes a problem. These are basically sources for nucleation of, uh, of, of uh, cracks. And so this is more of a fatigue problem. It's not really an impact problem, if, if I understand this right. Uh, and I must say, I'm not an expert in fatigue, but from what I've read and what I've observed over uh, with, with talks and conferences and things like that, I would assume it's really about controlling the competition between toughness or uh, fracture toughness and strength. Um, and this, this is a classical problem and maybe uh, the source lies in understanding how you control the distribution of second phase particles inside the material. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't really have much insight into uh, what the standards can change. Okay. Uh, 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 actually, I received a message from Alex Sun. Uh, Alex Sun, if you would like to talk, you can talk first and then Jim may follow you. Um, so, Alex Sun. <coughs> Hi, uh, Vignesh. Uh, yeah, nice talk. <laughs> yeah, so very interesting. Uh, you have a polycrystalline domain on this ceramic. And I just wonder, you know, this may be a naive question. Uh, will this polycrystal domain uh, mark structure uh, involved during the uh, circuit loading or your electric field? Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, uh, how does this polarization depends on the crystal orientation? You know, that's just a uh, from material point point of view, you know, to understand this problem. Uh, this is a good question. So essentially, um, if you think of a, so, there is a poly domain structure. So domain, you can think of it like the twins that we talked about before, except that you have a different. So the change in the crystal orientation across a domain wall basically means that you have a change in the polarization state, right? Because the crystal itself is a polarized crystal. The polarization comes from that separation that I talked talked to you about between the center of the positive and negative surface. The crystal structure itself has a net polarization to it. And when you change the orientation, you imagine that you have a distribution of these different orientations inside your, your medium. When you change that, or when you have a different distribution of those polarizations, your net volume average polarization changes. Right? That's that's how this whole- Yeah, you have, I mean, you have a distribution of this polarization and you exactly. are yes. integrating over the domain. So Precisely. maybe that's, that's a, Want to modeling in the future of the exactly, area. and that's exactly how it's done. So the way it's done is you simply use a volume average measure of spatially localized polarizations, 
And so, for example, if we were doing measurements of that sort, you would essentially take a volume average of these different polarizations that you measure and you'd measure macroscopic polarization. Or the opposite would basically be where you measure macroscopic polarization. And that's because of the volume average of these microscopic domains. So use that to say, let's say I have a volume fraction of a specific type of domain and a vol another volume fraction of another type of domain. The change in volume fraction of these two domains would be controlled, would be, you could understand that from the macroscopic polarization switching problem. That's a very crude sense of putting it. Now, how does this depend on crystal, crystal orientation? That's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have a, so one way of answering this question is, um, let's say I have a domain wall, right? So I have a domain wall where the orientation of polarization is different. Now I apply an electric field with respect to the crystallographic orientation and the driving force on this domain wall is defined as something that's normal to the wall. Right? So this driving force depends on some, some electric field applied to this grain. Yes. And you can imagine that you simply resolve the electric field normal to this, this domain wall. And that is what would drive the domain wall. So in a very simple, in a kinematic sense, you could simply say that if I change the orientation of my electric field with respect to the grain orientation, I can change how fast my domain evolves. So that's a very crude way of putting it. Um, now, the question of how it happens when you hit a, for example, when you hit a grain boundary, right? So does just, just like how we used to talk about it in the twinning context, when, when a domain wall hits a grain boundary, how does it transition across the grain boundary is a question that we don't have an answer to. And I'm not quite sure what the answer to that question is. Um, but how does, the, how does the change in polarization depend on orientation of the grain? That could simply be by resolving the, the electric field vector with respect to the crystallographic tensor and then resolving that um, normal to your domain wall. Right. This is, I know this is a very complex problem, but yeah. thank you for your time. Sure. Thank you for the question and great to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, Jin, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, Vignesh. So these experiments and the results is, is super neat. And Thank you. Thank you. So my question is quite a general. So uh, I read a book by James Noyce and Rohan. There are some face those like web publication. Also, uh, you know, maybe you know RD James and the Kaushik, they have some papers. Exactly. Yes, yeah, yes. Kaush yeah, Dan Kohlman. Many people. So so what's your point of view for this direction? Like what's the most significant challenges and the opportunities in the future? Right. So, um, so the Abhayaratne and Knowles is the classical textbook. It's a textbook that I've also been reading for a while. And that the, the concept of the jump condition, right? So the mm -hmm. thermodynamic driving force, that's basically Abhayaratne and Knowles' formulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically comes from the phase transitions. Uh, what, I, what we are trying to do here is actually uh, extract those thermodynamic driving forces mm -hmm. uh, using, so we have the jump condition across the interface, but then with modern high resolution measurement techniques, you can actually afford to go ahead and measure what happens at that interface, right? Mm -hmm. So um, while the theory exists for a while, I don't know enough if the experiments actually went ahead and tried to probe the driving forces. So imagine if you have a full field measurement, you have a distribution of domain walls or interfaces inside your medium in general. Mm -hmm. If you could actually have a measured map of the driving forces on these different interfaces, mm -hmm. that is powerful information because now with, if you're doing time dissolved imaging, you can actually extract how fast these, these interfaces are propagating. You have mm. the driving forces on these interfaces, and now you have a, a wealth of information there about the kinetics as a function of temperature, as a function of defects, as a function of mm -hmm. any type of material property that you can afford to control inside your medium. I see. And this, I think, is a direction which is very useful for experimental mechanics in general, especially for multi-scale mechanics. Because, for example, phase field models, if, if I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar, so if you're familiar with phase field models, mm -hmm. Um, you, you know that you basically prescribe um, a kinetic relation, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of, lot of those kinetics are simply Allen Kahn kinetics these days from what I understand. I'm not an expert in phase field modeling, but I listen to people who do this every day. Yeah. Um, and the question is, can we actually feed input? So if these kind of measurements that I described a few seconds back mm -hmm. can be used as input to high resolution phase field models, and we now have excellent predictive capabilities there where your kinetics of the interface is no longer a diffusion or a gradient based um, uh, 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 gradient descent based Allen Kahn kinetic relation. It's actually a non equilibrium kinetic relation that gives you realistic measurement or predictions of rate effects. So mm -hmm. I think that's one direction that we can go into, especially now that we have nanosecond time resolution, we're getting to microsecond, even sub, sub micro, sorry, micrometer, sub micrometer spatial resolutions, even in optical imaging. Mm -hmm. I think this is an excellent direction that can actually offer insight to theory. 
not just in doing measurements and say let's just use it for validation of large scale of validation of homogeneous models we can actually use it to inform these small scale models so just to follow your answer so yeah. so re- during the recent years there are some like uh, improvement for the experiments either I saw Sam Daly or there's another group at the uh, Manchester, they do those high resolution SEM images, right? So my, my question is, uh, because your definition field is quite heterogeneous. Yes. So if you want to look at uh, like a larger field of view, mm-hmm. maybe they use some image stitching or quite a, quite a static, but you have some rate effects. If yeah. you do some rate effects, it doesn't mean like your field of view can be fixed and small. So can you, can you, have you considered to combine those like larger field of view mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the high strain rate? Honestly, I haven't really thought about it in detail till you mentioned it. I think it's an excellent direction to go into. And I think there are ways of doing this, right? So for example, um, let's say typically for, um, if, you, if you can afford to get a couple of high-speed cameras, right? If maybe two or three high-speed cameras, sure. um, it's all about triggering those cameras. And, uh, and I'm sure you, you probably know as well as I do that triggering is the complicated piece in these high-speed machines. Um, mm-hmm. But if you are able to focus on multiple different regions of the sample mm-hmm. um, and, and then do image stitching that way, sure. Uh, but that's just a lot more expensive, obviously. Yeah, that I can see. Because you use the Corona, that's, that's exactly. super expensive. Uh, and, and I'm... If it were me, I would not buy 5K runners just because I want to do enough because I wouldn't have the money for it. Yeah. Um, the, the nice thing, so the complicated, what we could do is actually collect multiple data sets, right? So imagine mm-hmm. you're collecting multiple data sets and then you get statistical measures of rates and, and uh, evolution rates. Then you could simply repeat these experiments over and over again and look at different fields of view. It's much harder in the dynamic impact experiments because they're destructive. What I like a lot about the ferroelectrics is this is this is sort of a reversible process. Once you have the entire sample assembly in, you could simply cycle electric fields back and forth and get information about it. Of course, you're not going to get repeatable microstructure because it's not a deterministic process, but at the very least, we can get statistics. Um, also, I think at this stage, I'm at this stage of where research is, I'm not sure we even need very large fields of view. Um, I, I think you can get you can get good enough. Uh, I think with the existing high-speed imaging techniques, we can get enough uh, fields or uh, fields of view to extract kinetics mm-hmm. but in this case we just need to design a lot more boundary conditions for different types of experiments mm-hmm. instead of having a large sample where the boundary conditions are heterogeneous or mm-hmm. where the local conditions on the on the boundaries are heterogeneous and you simply have to do a statistical analysis of what that is so it's pros and cons i think if if you want to spend relatively lesser money you just have to spend a little more time getting enough number of data sets with different boundary conditions, different loading conditions. And in principle, with these kind of measurements, you can isolate particular domain walls. You don't have to nucleate too many domain walls inside your system or interfaces inside your system. You simply look at one interface and see how that interface propagates. It's almost like a little game that you can play by controlling temperature and see how fast the interface propagates. So in that sense, I don't think you need uh, too much of field of view. I think it's just a resolution that matters. At least that's that's my perspective on uh, what we need right now. Of course, stitching, image stitching, and getting large fields of view is a is a very important problem. But I don't I don't know if we're there yet in terms of understanding. Yeah, thank you for sharing these insights. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the question. It was a very interesting question. I didn't think about this before, honestly. Oh, hi, hi, Dong. Please. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, Vignesh. Uh, thank you for your fantastic and uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hai Dong. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Georgia Tech, okay. uh, working on the biomechan- biotissue mechanics. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm not very familiar with, uh, with, with, with the property of the magnesium, yeah. and, uh, but I, uh, so I have a small question. Sure. Um, I wonder what's, uh, what's the strength value for, for the magnesium uh, under statistic, uh, stati- uh, st- static uh, uh, strand, uh, static loading. So we're and, talking, we're talking about tens, tens of megapascal uh, along the orientations that we were probing. Uh, you could go up to hundred megapascals, I think, when you change the orientation of low of loading with respect to the crystal, because it's ha- it's highly anisotropic. So I, if I actually go back to some of the data that I showed you. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is a, this is a stress strain curves at different rates. Okay. So we're talking initial 
yield is a is a rather crude term and there are some details there but if you'd like to think of yield in that sense we're talking 20 to 50 megapascal um and this could go up to really high strengths because what happens here is when you reorient the crystal so you're applying load when the crystal orientation is like is um, along the direction of my left finger and you switch the orientation because of the twinning right when you switch the orientation you're now compressing along a harder orientation so then the strengthening increases a lot okay so that's why the strength is is increasing significantly but we're talking yields of the order of 20 to 40 megapascal okay thank you Oh, hi, uh, Vijanesh. Uh, I have a few questions. Sure. So my, my background is, is computational and I, I learned some of the plasticity thing, but mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure that I understand correctly. So in your talk, basically, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, is that we used the traditional crystal plasticity framework and we, we, we add a term for viscoplastic, a uh, viscoplastic term for twinning. Yep. And for training by doing experiments, we find some parameter values for that formulation in that training term. And then we add that to the uh, conventional viscoplastic framework. And then oh. that, uh, uh, Yes and no. So th this is the, this last equation is what you're talking about, correct? Right. So what, this is, this is what people use in crystal plasticity, but to actually model this gamma dot, they do not go to this step that we were doing. Right. So in this step, they use a lumped formulation for this rate of change of volume fraction, at least a lot of crystal plasticity codes. They use this lumped volume fraction and they treat it as pseudo slip. Right. So, for example, if you've if you've looked at dislocation uh, rates, the rate of change of, dis of uh, strain due to dislocations, they would use some sort of a power law. Right. Similarly, right. what they what reason what most at least the, the crystal plasticity codes that I had read at the time. They simply use the same type of power law for the rate of change of twin volume fraction. They do not do this step that I was talking about simply because it's a lot more complicated to do so. Mm -hmm. And but what what I am trying to to put down here is that at some level, trying to look at this competition between nucleation and growth is important to be able to capture rate effects up there. Mm, understand. Right? And that is not probably going to be picked up by some conventional or some. Uh, mm old power law system. So that's basically what I'm talking about. So you're right in saying that this is exactly what they use, but they do not go down to the heterogeneity that we're talking about. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work. So uh, uh, another curiosity is that for such a traditional framework, do you have your uh, in-house code or do you use some open source software for this framework? This so I actually do not do computations. I, I yeah. these, these are not, so the reason I put this is because people, other people use uh, crystal plasticity codes. And this was simply to say that this is something that you could do inside your crystal plasticity code. I don't do crystal plasticity myself. Uh -huh. um, I have collaborated yeah. with a few um, uh, experts in crystal plasticity, but we've never really incorporated this into crystal plasticity codes as yet. So uh, okay. honestly, I have not done crystal plasticity myself. I only know the governing equations. Really. Okay, so because I'm interested in that, but I don't know if there's a, a sort of standard way to do that because usually for crystal plus this different groups have different codes. So I'm wondering, did you use any software or you have some collaborate collaborations for with certain groups that use their own code? Right. So um, what we I used to collaborate with a group from the University of Houston. This is the group of Professor Shailendra Joshi. Um, and they have developed, what they do is they develop their own UMAT. So the, their U, okay. UMAT, UMAT for Abacus and uh, they use their UMAT um, in Abacus. So the, the UMAT was what they developed and they use that in Abacus. That's basically what they do. Um, I just understand a lot of people do something similar to that. Um, and in fact, when I was, the short time I was collaborating with them, we were actually trying to explore how we can incor incorporate these rate effects into their UMAT. Uh, but we never really got there because I had to graduate and leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, great, great. But that's typically how they do it. I think they usually write a UMAT. Uh, I believe, um, yeah, they are, they have their own UMAT and they basically modify their. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Uh, thank you. So my second question, I know some probably last question is that on your page sixteen, this is a very basic one. Uh, it's basically that for a person that who do not have any experience uh, for this type of uh, test. So how do you distinguish 
I mean, can you, can you at least teach me how to see a twinning? I mean, of course, when you see this uh, twin, yes, I know it's a twin. I know the definition of a twin from mm -hmm. the fundamental course, but mm -hmm. how to see a twin from this image distinguished from other deformation mechanism? This is an excellent question. So one thing is because we loaded it. So what we did was we did loading along specific orientation so that we would nucleate twins. So the experiment was designed to nucleate twins. So that's why we compressed it along the horizontal direction. If we had compressed it along the vertical direction, we probably would not have seen any twins. Oh, right? yes. That's the first thing. The second thing is the fact that a twin nucleus, because remember we saw the, um, the microscope image where you saw the volume defect. Now that volume defect basically means that you create a step on the surface of your sample. So the, the reason we were able to see this simply using light uh, was because of the fact that you have a step on the image. Now what you can use is you can use polarized light, right? So what happens is when you have a polarized light source on the surface of your sample, and when you have a step, the reflected light intensity into your camera will have a different polarization and hence a different intensity. That's one way in which we can observe it, right? Um, another way, and uh, another way in which we can go ahead and confirm what we're seeing are actually twins is by doing recovery experiments. So this is what we did, and I have not shown that data here. But what we did was we stopped the experiment at a given strain, we take the sample out, and then we take it to an electron microscope, and there we can actually map the crystal orientations as a function of space, and then we can confirm that these actually have an orientation that we know is a twin. Very similar to the experiments I showed you early on uh, with our collaborators in. Uh, John Hopkins, right? These these measurements, right? Imagine you have a single slice of this of this block, that basically tells you that the green areas are twins and the, the blue areas are matrices. So the, this is another way of looking at it, but this way you cannot do it in a time resolution. You cannot look at microsecond time series. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it seems the boundary conditions are quite important. Boundary uh, conditions are very important to understand the problem. It's not important to see the mechanism, but then there is no point in just seeing the mechanism and not knowing what you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. So right. it's important in trying to extract the kinetics from it. So may I say that, for example, if if I do not do this type of test, I just do a universal, you know, a general deformation boundary condition, a very general one. Yep. Uh, that would be challenging to 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 know what specific deformation uh, magnetism, right? Because there could there could be dislocation, twinning, or yeah, all true. that. Oh, Okay. This is this is true exactly. Um, although, if you do know what you say, you you apply a general um, uh, a general boundary condition, but if you knew what boundary condition you applied, right, um, and you know what your crystal orientation is with respect to your boundary condition, then you can get a sense of the ratio or or the relative competition between these different mechanisms, because you're dealing with a crystal, you know what mechanisms will be activated. And so your crystal plasticity will essentially give you the different mechanisms that will be activated, right? The problem though, is if you're trying to investigate rate dependence, the crystal plasticity calculation does not have accurate rate dependence inside it in many cases. And so there your crystal plasticity code might not give you the accurate ratio of different mechanisms that take but you can know what mechanisms will take. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk. So the, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, if not, uh, let us uh, uh, thank Vignesh again and wrap up our today's uh, seminar. Uh, Jin, do you have any uh, uh, final words to say? Maybe for next one or? Yeah, next Sunday is the, is the last one for this season. So hope to see you again next Sunday. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.